and we're lucky enough to have Chuck who works out of here and has for the last few years and um, me and a couple of the other guys around here were raised under Chuck's wing and um, Black River bought the place and we're so nice to keep us around. When this studio was redone, the first album in here was uh, Miranda Lambert's last album, her previous album that they had five singles pulled from it and one album of the year and um, it's done quite well. So we're now into her, her next album um, and it just, Nick said something to me yesterday, was it? He said, do you remember that you agreed to do this thing with Sal, uh, Solid State Logic? <laughs> it was a few days ago. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but I said, no, that's cool. I mean, I said, we're, you know, we're mixing anyhow, so we can just kind of talk about this mix that I'm working on. So um, that's what we're going to, we're going to listen to a, a mix on Miranda Lambert's new album. One of the main points of this discussion is that I prefer to work on a large format analog console rather than mix in the in the box. And I mean, it's not as though I haven't tried. I mean, it would be awesome if it worked. Uh, you know, I mean, number one, you wouldn't have this big thing interfering in the sonic space, so you'd have a better in monitoring environment. Um, so that'd be great and it'd be great because you know i mean somebody could call you up and say hey could you change this on the mix that you did a couple of days ago and it'd be just a simple um you know open up the session and make the change and um export it and send it off to them it'd be awesome if it worked for me but i mean i just there's no um intuitiveness for me and a mouse. I, mean, I, I can go about editing all day long and there's and it's not as though I I'm ignorant of a workstation. I mean I use them every day. I mean I use it fairly completely I believe but mixing on it I gotta have my fingers on faders. I gotta be able to reach an analog knob that has you know that does the same thing whenever you change it not you know, so because you get used to a feel, um, you you know that when you start like tweaking the the high end gain that it's gonna like have a certain response. With a controller, I don't get that same feedback from the knob. I mean, I I do feel as though controllers are a step ahead from the mouse itself because the mouse is just like you know you can only do one thing at a time and. Um, and you're literally like looking at a picture and just kind of changing the picture rather than using your ears. Um, so I do think the controller is a big step ahead to have something you can put your fingers on um, and adjust multiple things at once. But for me, it really is this beast. Um, and, and then I do think there's a, a sonic thing about going back through an analog desk. Um, I've had digital consoles that, you know, have a lot of the same feedback that this uh, console provides, but the sound of the compressors wasn't the same. You couldn't get the same kind of gushy thing out of them. Panning didn't feel the same. I always, I always feel like when you like send to an effect um, in the digital domain it's different than f feeding from an analog desk I don't know what that is it's just I, 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 it, maybe it's the the log rhythm of the the pot itself uh, whatever it's I don't know I mean it's I, I just feel as though when I'm working in the digital world it's like looking at pictures when I'm working on this, I'm closing my eyes and just hearing it. And then I always um, <clears throat> mix to uh, one inch analog as well as back to the hard disk system. I always record at 96K. Um, I would record it at, at 192 if, if I could, you know, I mean, I just, there's like a huge level jump up in quality from 96 to 192 just kind of like the same huge jump up from 48 to 96 um, but it's you know I mean just the the tools when you start getting into a lot of 
tracks at 192 is really not possible. So, um, but I still, there's still an awful lot of people recording it at 48k, 44.1, which it blows my mind. You know, there's all this um, new um, consumer equipment coming out that's um, going to play high-res discs and or high-res files. And you know, if your your music's not recorded in, in high-res, it's it's no longer going to be valid. I mean, to some degree. I mean, there's you know, people are going to start buying music because it is high res. So I think it's really important to start up in the game, you know, and trying to make the best sounding, the high res um, product that you can. But it, back to the analog thing, I still really like the sound of analog. Um, the Pistol Annie's record, somebody commented about how they liked the recent Pistol Annie's record. That we actually tracked analog. Um, this one we didn't. Um, but I, I have a one-inch uh, ATR100 out there. Sad to say, Mike Spitz is no longer with us. But um, it's a great sounding machine, and, and uh, so we record to that, save the the analog to send to mastering, but also record back to the hard disk as a safety. So I could actually play you the analog versus the digital if you wanted to hear it. Well, definitely, you know, there's, there's the transients are sort of rounded off. Um, so the hard hits, the kind of pokey things about a digital, pure digital mix kind of get absorbed by the analog. And to me, it kind of just makes for a more rounder, more musical kind of record. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a bit of sort of low frequency distortion that kind of smears the bottom end and makes it kind of gushier. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of high end roll off that just kind of takes away that sort of, that irritant. It kind of focuses the music and <clears throat> maybe um, th that's what I grew up with, so that's what I prefer. I don't know. I mean, I, it seems as though you know, when I play, compare it for people, and you know, you can sit there and A, B, one or the other, most people prefer the analog. And, you know, we send both to mastering, and I would say on an album, probably 90% of the album ends up being analog. There'll be a couple of tracks that, that kind of sound better as digital. Um, sometimes, sometimes it can, do too much, you know, and part of that's the alignment, you know, how hard you hit the machine. Um, so there is a kind of a little bit of a um, compromise to be done. So you have to use your ears again, you know. <laughs> I remember looking at album covers and looking at these people making their music in these like mysterious places and to me the studio holds that kind of magic that you know it's there's something about coming to a studio and being in a studio environment that gets the best out of musicians and part of it is because it costs money to be here so you, you're not just going to screw around you know I mean you come in here you get serious you're going to like for people who are first starting out it can maybe be intimidating but generally what I see is it, it tends to bring the best out of musicians and, and artists and um, makes, it, makes them feel like what we're doing is important and that we're not just, you know, messing around in a bedroom. So I, I think that's the value of a studio. To me, it's, I, you know, I love going to the studio. It's, uh, I mean, what better playground, you know? I mean, look at all this. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, my tune bus compressor, yeah, it's pretty, pretty standard. I just four to one, and, and the attack time is 10 milliseconds, and the quickest release, that's kind of, I don't, I try other stuff and I always end up going back there. I mean, I, I think it's because I don't like to hear the bus compressor so much and I definitely like to hear dynamics. I like to hear music breathe. 
and you know you can make a record louder by going to you know I mean if you go to attack all the way to the extreme left you can really crank the compressor and make it really loud but there's nothing left I mean it's just like <laughs> and I I mean I like to hear dynamics I mean all you can do that later in mastering anyhow you know I mean I, I'm a big believer that there's there's people better at maximizing gain than I am. I mean, I use compressors for a, the, to create a musical thing, you know, to create power or to com just create the the sonic illusion of compression. You know, like like an old Beatles record sounded compressed or a Stones record sounded compressed. Or I don't do it though, and they didn't do it really. F I mean, they did it to some degree for gain so that they could get it on an LP. But it 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 was more for the illusion of like power at a lower volume. Whereas today, what people use compressors for is just maximizing gain, and I, to me, that's a really boring record. It's just loud and. It, the only way it sounds good is at like this minuscule level. Once you turn it up louder than that, you just go, uh, turn it off, please. And I think it's part of the problem with our business is that, you know, everything's just maximized gain and there's no sort of dynamic and it, um, there's no way into the record. Well, get some good speakers listen to listen to a lot of music a lot of different kinds of music I mean you might have a kind of music that's your favorite but you can learn from everything that you listen to um, and if you're going to be an engineer you're likely going to have to do lots of kinds of music that you not necessarily are a fan of so you um, uh, probably don't get married. <laughs> um, not not until you you know you kind of well along your your the the path. Um, today's world is very different from the one that I came up in. I think there's lots of opportunities that there wasn't when I came up. I mean there was a you know a handful of studios in town that was the only place that you could learn your craft. Now, you know, I mean, the, the, the craft is, can be learned, you know, on your laptop. Um, and, and there's lots of opportunities to discover talent and work with them um, and potentially share in, in the income that they make. It, it's probably not going to be as much about CD sales or downloads as it's going to be about getting involved with, you know, an artist and, and like sharing in their t-shirt sales and their, you know, everything. I mean, you need to get really smart about the business and understand that if you're going to invest a large amount of time in developing an artist, that the way you're going to get a return from that is not from streaming. I mean, if you see my royalty statements, it's a whole bunch of zeros after the decimal point. <laughs> Not a lot of, those don't add up to a lot of pennies. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's kind of depressing. I mean, you, you can still make money on back ends of records, but it has to be a very successful record, you know. Um, so uh, I think kind of figuring out how you can develop an artist and work with them and, um, is, is uh, probably a way forward. And there's just lots of opportunities to, you know, work in artist studios and, or producers' home studios and help out that, that there weren't when I came up. You, you just had to get in one of these things, you know. I, I would suggest, though, um, if, if you get the opportunity to, to get in a studio and work in a studio because the environment is so conducive to making music that, that you know, using an, an, an acoustic space to create the sound rather than a plug-in is like it's just going to sound more organic and I don't know.
There's, I mean, I could tell you loads of things. <laughs> tell you how to get a job, I can't. I just, you just got to be persistent and just love doing it. And um, eventually, you know, if it's your destiny, it's going to work out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. Yeah, Let's you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me.